One of the most common Muslim objections to Christianity goes something like this. You Christians say that Jesus died on the cross for sins, but how can God punish an innocent man for other people's sins? That's like saying that God could punish a baby for the sins of a murderer and then forgive the murderer. In Islam, each person pays for his own sins, and when Allah wants to forgive people, he doesn't need to punish an innocent man for what they've done, he can just forgive them. So the Christian view is unfair and unjust, while the Muslim view is fair and just. Sound familiar? If you're a Christian who has Muslim friends, I'm sure you've heard this plenty of times. And if you're a Muslim, I'm sure you've thought or said this plenty of times. When I hear this objection, I'm tempted to refute it by quoting what the Bible says about Jesus dying on the cross for sins, and then quoting what the Quran says about the Bible being the inspired, incorruptible, authoritative word of God, leaving Muslims with the choice of either accepting what the Bible says about Jesus' death or rejecting what the Quran says about the Bible, either of which would be apostasy, according to Islam. But in this video, we're going to take a closer look at the objection, because I want you Christians out there to understand that you have nothing to fear from Muslim objections to Christianity. Muslim objections to Christianity are opportunities. You shouldn't think, oh no, what if my Muslim friend says it's not fair for God to punish Jesus for the sins of others? You should be thinking, I can't wait for my Muslim friend to say it's not fair for God to punish Jesus for the sins of others, because that's going to open the door to an amazing conversation. There are devastating responses to the most common Muslim objections, and I'm convinced that if Christians would simply take the time to learn them, it would change the world. To show you how this works, I'm going to use this common Muslim objection to prove, one, that the Quran contradicts itself, two, that Muhammad was a false prophet, and three, that Jesus is the only hope for sinners according to both Christianity and Islam. Now, if you're a Muslim and you're watching this, I hope you're saying to yourself, there's no way he's going to do all that in this short video. If that's what you're thinking, hold on to that thought until I'm finished, and then tell me in the comments section that I didn't do everything I said I was going to do. So why do Muslims say that Islam teaches that no one can pay for the sins of others? Well, if it's the average Muslim, he's just heard this from friends and family or his imam. But if you can find a Muslim who actually knows what the Quran says, you'll be told that there are several verses of the Quran which say that no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. Let's read one. Quran, chapter 6, verse 164. Say, what? Shall I seek a Lord other than Allah? And he is the Lord of all things, and no soul earns evil but against itself, and no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. No bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, where burden refers to a person's burden of sin. Chapter 17, verse 15, chapter 35, verse 18, chapter 39, verse 7, and chapter 53, verse 38 say the same thing. But Muslims read these verses and declare, you see, Islam teaches that no one can bear the burdens of others. Each person pays for his own sins. So Islam promotes justice and fairness, unlike Christianity, which says that Jesus died on the cross for other people's sins. Unfortunately for our Muslim friends, there are some problems with this claim. First problem, the Quran contradicts itself on this point because other verses say that some people will bear the burdens of others. For instance, in chapter 16, verses 22 through 25, Allah says that false teachers will bear their own burdens and the burdens of those they lead astray. The passage reads, Your God is one God, so as for those who do not believe in the hereafter, their hearts are ignorant and they are proud. Truly Allah knows what they hide and what they manifest. Surely he does not love the proud. And when it is said to them, what is it that your Lord has revealed, they say, stories of the ancients, that they may bear their burdens entirely on the day of resurrection, and also of the burdens of those whom they lead astray without knowledge. Allah sometimes even changes his story from one verse to the next. In chapter 29, verse 12, he says that unbelievers will never bear the wrongs of others. Then in the very next verse, he says that unbelievers will bear their own burdens and the burdens of others. But don't take my word for it. Quran 29, 12. And those who disbelieve say to those who believe, follow our path and we will bear your wrongs. And never shall they be the bearers of any of their wrongs. Most surely they are liars. See that? They will never bear any of the wrongs of others. As long as we don't read the very next verse, which says, And most certainly they shall carry their own burdens and other burdens with their own burdens. And most certainly they shall be questioned on the resurrection day as to what they forged. So apparently some people will bear the burdens of others, thus contradicting the Quran's own no bearer of burden shall bear the burdens of others rule. Second problem 
Muslims don't just believe in Allah, who says in the Quran both that no bearer of burdens shall bear the burdens of others, and that some people will bear the burdens of others. They also believe in Muhammad, who says that Allah will punish Christians and Jews in hell for the sins of Muslims. Let's read four quotations from Muhammad. Sahih Muslim 6665. Allah's Messenger said, When it will be the day of resurrection, Allah would deliver to every Muslim, a Jew or a Christian, and say, That is your rescue from hellfire. How is a Christian or a Jew going to rescue a Muslim from hellfire? By going to hell in the Muslim's place. Sahih Muslim 6666. Allah's Apostle said, No Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. For every Muslim who dies, Allah is going to put a Jew or a Christian in hell in place of the Muslim. But it gets even better, Muslims, because it doesn't matter how much you've sinned, Allah will just make Jews and Christians pay for what you've done. Sahih Muslim 6668. Allah's Messenger said, There would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a mountain. And Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. If you're a Muslim, you can have sins as heavy as a mountain. No problem. Allah will punish Jews and Christians for your mountain of sins. Summing up Muhammad's view, we have 110 Ahadith Qudsi, number 8. Allah's Messenger said, On the day of resurrection, my Ummah, nation, will be gathered into three groups. One sort will enter paradise without rendering an account of their deeds. Another sort will be reckoned an easy account and admitted into paradise. Yet another sort will come bearing on their backs heaps of sins like great mountains. Allah will ask the angels, though he knows best about them, Who are these people? They will reply, They are humble slaves of yours. He will say, Unload the sins from them and put the same over the Jews and Christians. Then let the humble slaves get into paradise by virtue of my mercy. Allah will order the angels to unload mountains of sins from Muslims and put those mountains of sins on Jews and Christians. Keep in mind, the guy revealing this to his followers is the same guy who revealed the Quran verses saying that no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, and other Quran verses saying that some people will bear their own burdens and the burdens of others. Is it just me, or does it seem like Muhammad is inventing this as he goes along? Either way, our Muslim friends tell us that it's unjust and unfair and immoral for God to punish one person for the sins of others, and here we have Muhammad saying that's exactly what God's going to do, which means that, according to our Muslim friends, Muhammad was a false prophet who accused God of being unjust, unfair, and immoral. And as for those Muslims who resort to the weak Hadith defense, which Western Muslims use to reject any Hadith that doesn't line up with their watered-down, whitewashed Walt Disney version of Islam, sorry, all four of the Ahadith I quoted are classified as Sahih. So if you're going to reject multiple Sahih narrations, if you're throwing out your best material, I'm afraid we can't know anything about your prophet. Third problem. Let's be as generous as possible. There are Muslims who pick and choose which parts of the Quran and Muhammad's teachings they want to believe, and the part they want to believe here is that no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, because that's the part they can use to condemn Christianity. So let's pretend that the Quran doesn't contradict itself on whether people can bear the burdens of others, and let's pretend that Muhammad didn't declare over and over again that Allah will punish Jews and Christians in hell for the sins of Muslims. Let's just look at the part that Muslims want to believe. Notice what the Quran actually says. It doesn't say, no one shall bear the burden of another. It says, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. In other words, no one who already has a burden of sin, no sinner, no bearer of burden, can bear the burdens of others. Why? Because if you've already got a burden of sin, you're under God's judgment. You're in no position to tell God that you're going to take care of other people's sins. You've got your own sins to deal with. So no one who has a burden of sin can bear the burdens of others. Excellent theology, I agree completely. But what door does this leave wide open? Someone who has no burden of sin, someone who is sinless, voluntarily bearing the burdens of others. Can we think of someone who has no burden of sin? If you're a Muslim and you're shouting, Muhammad, please open your Quran and read chapter 40, verse 55, chapter 47, verse 19, and chapter 48, verse 2, where Allah repeatedly commands Muhammad to ask forgiveness of his sins. Then read Sahih al-Bukhari, 6307, where Muhammad says, By Allah, I seek Allah's forgiveness and turn to him in repentance more than 70 times a day. 70 times a day? That's like every 20 minutes. What was this guy doing? Muhammad is not sinless in Islam. 
but Jesus is. The Quran, chapter 19, verse 19, calls Jesus faultless. According to Muhammad, Satan touches every child born in the world except Jesus. Satan couldn't touch Jesus. Sahih al-Bukhari, 3286. The prophet said, when any human being is born, Satan touches him at both sides of the body with his two fingers, except Jesus, the son of Mary, whom Satan tried to touch but failed, so he touched the placenta cover instead. Ever notice that even the degraded version of Jesus we find in the Muslim sources is better than Muhammad? The Bible agrees that Jesus is unique. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 1 Peter 2.21-22, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 1 John 3, 5, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So the message of Christianity is that the one person ever who could bear our burden of sin did. The message of Islam is that the one person ever who could bear our burden of sin did not. And the result of Islam denying the work of Jesus while claiming to affirm his message is that Muslims are left with an incoherent book, a prophet who tries to push the sins of his followers onto the backs of Jews and Christians, and a Messiah who's greater and more miraculous than every other human being in history for no reason whatsoever. And yet there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world who think we're the ones who have a problem here. They think we're the ones with the problem because their leaders don't bother to tell them what the Quran actually says or what Muhammad actually said. The sad reality is that we're the ones who need to tell Muslims what their religion teaches. They're not going to hear it from anyone else. They're not going to hear it from their imams or from politicians or from the media. We have to do it. Now, I've done my part by putting all of this into a video. Your part is to share this information with your Muslim friends. In fact, I'll make it even easier. If you click on the link in the description box, you'll find all of the sources I quoted in this video. Cut and paste away. For you Muslims who are watching, I know you're hearing most of what I've said in this video for the first time, even though I'm quoting your most trusted sources. At this point, you should be asking yourself, why have my sheikhs and imams never bothered to tell me any of this? They don't tell you what your sources say because they know that some of you will realize that your prophet's position on salvation and judgment is completely incoherent and they're worried that you might not have the sort of faith that allows you to continue believing in Islam after realizing that it's completely incoherent. So they have to keep you in a state of ignorance to protect you from apostasy. But there's another question you should be asking yourself, and this is the one that should keep you up at night. If your sheikhs and imams haven't told you what Muhammad really said about salvation and judgment, what else haven't they told you about Islam? I know they've told you that the Bible has been corrupted. I also know they haven't told you what the Quran actually says about the Bible. If you'd like to learn what Islam teaches about the Bible, click on this video and prepare for shock and awe.